welcome to Yoga and Ball Rolling for the Hips and Shoulders. My name is Kimberly Main. I'm a certified personal trainer and registered yoga teacher specializing in therapeutic yoga for physical and mental health injuries. Today in this workshop, you're going to learn about the basic anatomy and kinesiology or movement and function of the hip and shoulder, some common problems and injuries we see in the hip and shoulder, and yoga and ball rolling exercises to help decrease pain, improve function, and encourage healing in the hips and shoulders. So I hope you enjoy. Both the hip and shoulder joints are ball and socket joints that move in six different movement patterns. For the shoulder joint, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external rotation, and internal rotation. The hip, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external rotation, and internal rotation. The hip and the shoulder are not designed to have the same stability and mobility simply for their purpose in the body. So for the uh, pelvis and the hips, this needs to be a very stable area in the body to be able to support the upper torso. Whereas the shoulder joint needs to be a lot more mobile so that we can reach and grasp, we can climb, we can carry, we can extend the arm, twist and rotate the arm and hand. The shoulder joint is the most mobile joint in the body, but it's also one of the most um, instable joints in the body and most common for injury. And we'll talk about that a little later. The shoulder has three different bones attached to it. The humerus or upper arm bone, the clavicle, and the scapula. The upper arm bone and the scapula form what's called the glenohumeral joint, which is where the capsule sits we talked about earlier that holds the synovial fluid. The problem with this joint is that the upper arm bone or humerus that sits into the socket here, into the um, scapula, is like it's sitting a golf ball on a golf tee. So it's very instable. The muscles that support the joint called the rotator cuff are often very prone to injury as well, simply because they're supporting a joint that is so unstable already. Rotator cuff muscles sit on the front of the scapula on top and behind. We'll touch on a little bit more on those muscles later on, some common injuries and ways that you can um, try to decrease your chance of injury. Next, we're gonna look at the hip joint a little bit closer and a little bit more about its stability and mobility and how it differs from the shoulder. The final injury or problem with a shoulder that can occur is called bursitis. Bursitis is due to an inflammation of the bursa or fluid filled sacs filled with synovial fluid in the shoulder. These sacs are present so that they can help with padding of the shoulder because there's so much movement that occurs within the shoulder joint. We need this additional padding and synovial fluid sacs to allow the sh shoulder to move effectively and decrease our chance of injury. Bursitis occurs generally when we already have impingement syndrome present or tendonitis. So if you do have any of these problems or injuries, there are different ball rolling exercises and yoga postures that you can do to help decrease your pain and improve your function. And we're gonna discuss those next. Next, we're going to talk about some ball rolling exercises and then yoga postures that you can do to help with any shoulder pain or if you're having any tightness in the shoulders. We're going to start with one tennis ball and placing it to your upper trapezius muscle or upper shoulder here, not on the shoulder blade, but between the shoulder blade, your neck and your spine. And then you're going to lay back down onto that ball. And taking a few deep breaths, making sure you're not holding your breath. And you can pause here for as long as you'd like. 
you'd like, you can lift your arm up. Notice how that feels, maybe circling a little here. Taking the arm back or up to the side. And we'll spend about 30 seconds or a minute here, and then you would switch sides. I'm not going to. The next ball rating activity you can do is place the ball a little bit lower down even a little lower than I've got it here, but you can take two balls and do the same thing. So down your spine, a little bit lower than I have, not on your spine, but between that mid shoulder blade and your back. So you're gonna lie back and do the same thing here. Find that sweet spot. And then you're gonna lift your arms up again and pause. And if you'd like, you can bring your arms out to the side, see how that feels. <laughs> Making sure again, you can still breathe deep. And after that feels complete, maybe 30 seconds to a minute, you can roll over to your side off your balls. We're gonna put those to the side now. Do a few flowing movements with the arms. So just making sure that you're not arching your back. There's not a lot of space under your low back. You've got a nice long spine. This will help to stretch and uh, help mobilize the shoulders a little easier. So we're gonna lift the shoulders, uh, arms up. And then we're gonna float the arms overhead, but not using any muscular energy. So just floating the arms back and forth. Inhaling overhead, exhaling back. As you come overhead, I want you to notice if you're arching your back like I'm doing here, you don't want to do that because that's not helping your chest and your shoulders open. It's just arching your back to get your arms a little bit further behind you, which is we don't want to do. few more breaths here. Nice and slow using gravity. Flow the arms like you're moving your arms through water. And then bring the fingertips together. Let's take the arms out to the side. Again, like you're moving through water. Not using muscular energy, no need to go fast. So this is just helping create some space in that shoulder joint, some fluidity, increasing that synovial fluid. And once that's complete, you're gonna bring, make sure you can see here, your arms overhead into a Y position. Bring the arms down on the floor into a T position. Bringing the arms into a W position, keeping that rib cage hugging down to the mat. And then bringing the elbows up to 90 degrees in line with the shoulders. You can do that two more times. So a Y position, T to a W and an L. One more, Y, T, W and an F. Good. Next, we're going to use the wall for the next few postures. So, most of you have probably done a plank before. We're going to do a plank on the wall. So, find any wall that works. So, if this were my wall, I'd be pressing against the wall. Leaning forward, so here, walking the feet back, holding shoulder in line with the wrist. If that feels okay, you can try lowering yourself down into a half um, push-up and then pushing back up. 
or full push up on the wall. Backing your feet up. Making sure that you're keeping your body in alignment, that you're not dropping your belly down. The next option is with the wall as well. It's called extended puppy pose. So what you're gonna do is bring your arms up the wall, experiment with the different hand height, and walk your feet back. Bending your knees slightly. You could stay for 30 seconds to a minute. And the last one is called a shower stretch. So this one's bending your elbows, placing your hands on your elbows. And the elbows against the wall. And again, walking the feet back until you feel a stretch in the shoulder. Again, you could hold for 30 seconds to a minute there. The next option is called Warrior Two. So you're gonna bring your feet nice and wide, line your front heel up with the inside of your back foot or the back heel. Your distance of your feet should be as wide as the wrist kind of over top of the ankles here. And then you're gonna to bend to the front knee, make sure the knee is over the ankle. You can see your big toe mound, arms extending. And looking forward. If that doesn't feel good on the neck, you've got a shoulder issue, you can look to the side. Option with the arms to help with the shoulders is that you can come out of the pose, bring your arms overhead, and then dropping the arms down or maybe flowing them all the way down. So these are a few options. Getting that synovial fluid flowing, decreasing its consistency. And as you're ready, you can pause, arms extended, looking forward or to the side. 30 seconds to a minute. You can straighten that front leg, moving into triangle, moving the hips back. So you can put your hand into your hip crease here, move the hips back, reach that arm forward, Dropping that hand down and reaching that opposite arm up. That doesn't feel great on the shoulder. You can bring your hand behind your head. Okay, you can look up, but that doesn't feel good on the neck. You can look forward as well. Make sure there's not a lot of weight on that lower hand. And breathing here. If you can't breathe in a pose, this means you've gone too far. So just remembering to listen to your body. And again, spending maybe 30 seconds to a minute here. And then you repeat both those on the other side. The last two poses we're gonna to come to are on the floor. So this next one is called Locust Pose. So you're gonna come onto your belly, reach the arms forward, reach the legs back, a nice long spine and then bring the hands back along your sides. You can keep your hands by your hips or you can interlace your hands over top of your hips or bringing your hands out to the side. From here, pressing into the tops of your feet, rooting through your pelvis, you're gonna lift the upper body up and you can lift your feet and legs as well. It's up to you or try different positions with the hands. See what feels best with your shoulder. Maybe interlacing. Again, you spend about 30 seconds to a minute there and pressing yourself up. And if you have a pillow or what's called a bolster, which is a big yoga prop. Um, you can place it on your mat now. I'm just gonna grab mine and show you the last pose. So the last pose is called supported fish pose. 
So this is helping to be a passive pose to open the chest, which is often a constriction of, cause constriction in the shoulders. So you're gonna place your hips up against the bolster, lying back so your head is supported and turning your palms up. This allows the shoulder, the front of the shoulder to open and the chest. It's a nice supportive pose. But you may want to add to your own yoga practice at the end, right before your final relaxation. You can stay here for a lot longer if you'd like. But next we're going to move on to the hip and some common problems and some common solutions with ball rolling and yoga postures. Next we're going to talk about knee hips anatomy and some common problems that we see within the hip and hip joint. So the hip joint is made up of two main bones, the pubic bone and the femur or thigh bone running from the hip joint to the top of the knee. The two bones, the thigh bone and the femur bone are held together by multiple muscle groups tendons and ligaments. The pubic bone is actually made up of three fused together bones, the ilium up top here, the ischium down below, and the pubic bone. So all the muscles here and tendons and ligaments we see holding the hip joint together create the stability of the hip when we're walking, running, jumping, or doing many different things in our daily we're going to talk about some common problems in the hip, starting with a chronically contracted psoas muscle or constricted psoas muscle. So our psoas muscle runs from our lumbar spine, going up even a little higher, down in through the pelvis, down through and out to the top of our femur bone. This muscle can become constricted for many reasons. Often it's from just our daily life practices, sitting, driving, looking screens where we're constantly in a flexed position. It can also be contracted due to trauma or if you're very, very stressed. This is a muscle that generally takes the brunt of that stress and starts to contract. So if we do have trauma though that's existing in the body, this can also create some real unrest and anxiety, constant watchfulness, and an inability to really experience our able to try to release this muscle so that we can have um, less pain in our back as well. So often our pelvis can be rolled forward anteriorly due to a chronically contracted psoas muscle, causing a lot of pain in the low back. So I'm going to show you next some yoga and ball rolling exercises that can really help to release that. So the first exercise we're going to do is a tennis or ball rolling exercise. You can also use a lacrosse ball to release the psoas. So we're going to take the ball and place it on the belly button and roll between, halfway between your pubic bone and your belly button and then slightly down. And you're going to roll your whole body weight onto that ball and breathe in deep for 30 seconds to a minute per side. If you need a little bit more, you can get a bigger ball or a harder ball and try that. This exercise is a belly breath exercise, and this helps to stimulate the relaxation response in the body, opposite of fight or flight, which is what you want. So coming onto your back, placing your hands with the palm of your hand to the pubic bone, and then rolling the palms and fingertips towards one another. Inviting the breath into the belly for the count of one, Exhale, so you can fully inhale. 
that out for one to three minutes to really help bring that calming relaxation response. And then the next exercises are going to be some yoga poses and some core exercises you can do. So the first is a lunge. So any type of lunge, we're going to start with a low lunge, hip over top of the knee, front knee is bent, you're just going to shift forward here. Breathing 30 seconds to a minute. And of course, you can change sides. You can also do a high lunge, lifting the back knee. Whoops. Pressing back to that back heel. You can lift the arms overhead, interlacing the hands, releasing the index finger. This can be a bit much if you have a really tight muscle here, so maybe doing a low lunge to start. Another option is called Warrior One. So you're going to place your feet as if you're on two train tracks. Turn the back toes to 45 degrees out bending into the front knee, encouraging and pulling your pubic bone upwards towards your belly button. So if you're not over dumping into that low back. And then from here, you can lift the arms up, or you interlace the hands, making sure that back hip is really wrapping around to face forward. Another option is called pigeon pose. It's coming into tabletop, bringing your left knee to your left wrist, bringing your lower leg forward and walking your right toes and leg back. You can stay lifted or you can drop down onto your elbows. Some core exercises that you can do are some different plank exercises. So first is a front plank, starting with elbows under the shoulders, on your knees, and then you can lift up onto your toes. More challenge would be lifting one foot and then the other. This exercise makes sure your hips aren't rolling. So you can always wind your feet there. And then side plank. So stack knees, bent knees, shoulder over the elbow, lifting up. And then you can straighten your legs, stacking your feet. You want to lift an arm. And then again, lifting the top leg for more of a challenge. Maybe going through. 10 lifts and then changing sides. Or holding 30 seconds to a minute if you're just holding. The last one is a bridge exercise. Bending your knees, walking your fingertips towards the ankles. You're gonna lift your hips up. Then you wanna wash your back as it's overarching here. So again, really encouraging a bit of a pelvic tilt if you feel a lot of pressure in your low back. A little more of a challenge is you can lift one leg. Pause for five seconds, 10 seconds, and then changing sides. Again, holding for 30 seconds to a minute. And you can repeat these exercises maybe two or three times. Next, we're gonna move on to some calm problem you see with the external rotator muscles, back and leg. All right, so let's talk about the external rotators. The external rotators of your pins is to have Some of the yoga postures you can do are pigeon pose. 
wrist coming in into tabletop. Bring your left knee to the left wrist, walking your lower leg forward, right toes back, same as we did for the psoas muscle. So we're getting two birds with one stone here. And then dropping the elbows down to another option. You can hold this for longer than a minute if you'd like, and that tends to improve for greater results. You can also do what's called figure four, skid or line. So you're going to cross your left ankle over, lift up and out of the waist, make sure you're not curling your pelvis under. If that's too much on the knee, there's pain in the knee, you can also come on your back, cross your over, stay here, we'll reach through and draw that smile to the Another option is doing a seated spinal twist, sitting nice and tall, crossing the foot over your opposite knee, making sure that your pelvis is rolling to one side, reaching the arm up, twisting, grabbing on.
front foot is facing forward. You're going to put your hips into the hip crease. Do like a hip check with the hips behind you. Reach forward. Then rotating, looking up to the ceiling or forward if that feels better on your neck. Again, 30 seconds to a minute per side. Another option is extended triangle. So bending the front knee, lengthening through that back inner thigh. Reaching forward. Dropping your elbow to that thigh. Rotating the arm up. Or coming overhead. You can also drop your hand onto a yoga block in between the big toe and second toe, but make sure you're not rounding to get there. You want to keep length in both sides of your rib cage. That would be 30 seconds to a minute as well. The next problem we'll move on to is sciatica. The last and final problem we're going to talk about today is that the shoulder is frozen shoulder. So frozen shoulder is characterized by a lot of pain in the shoulder joint and muscles around the shoulder. Typically, we cannot lift our arm above the horizontal plane in front or out to the side. Frozen shoulder is generally caused by a victim injury to the shoulder, if we had some recent surgery, if we're diabetic, or if we have heart or lung disease. We can also tell if we have frozen shoulder if the pain is a lot worse at night. So what do we do about this frozen shoulder? Well, there's some yoga postures and different movements that you can do to help fall the frozen shoulder. So the first one we're gonna talk about is called the pendulum arms, arm swing. So how you're gonna do that is lean slightly forward using gravity to allow the upper arm bone to come out of that shoulder socket as much as it can, release, and then you're just gonna start to circle your arm not using a lot of muscular effort, you're just allowing the momentum to let that arm float around in a circle. And you can spend maybe 30 seconds to a minute here. Doing both sides, of course. The next option is a standing shoulder shrug. So you're gonna squeeze the shoulders up here, squeeze the shoulder blades together slightly, and then exhale, relax down. You can do that eight to 10 times. So inhaling, squeezing the shoulders together, and then exhale. We're gonna do three here, inhaling, squeeze together, and then exhaling. The next option is a supine shoulder shrug. So lying onto your back with your knees bent, extending your arms up towards the ceiling, and you're gonna lift your shoulder blades off the mat with an inhale, and then as you exhale, ha, relax those shoulders down with a little bit of effort. So inhaling up, and then a little slam back down. You can again do this eight to 10 times. So reaching up, and then exhaling. Inhale up, exhale. And our last pose here is called sunbird. So you're going to come into tabletop position, making sure your shoulders aren't shrugging to your ears, tucking the shoulder blades onto the mat, pressing down through both hands and knees and tucking your toes under or drawing those toes towards you. So you're nice and stable. From here, you're going to walk your right fingertips forward and then hovering the hand above the mat, or you can start to lift a little higher, make sure there's not too much pain and you can breathe. This is also a great core exercise to help create stability in the core, but you wanna make sure you're not dumping into one side of the hip. Holding for maybe three to five breaths on one side, and then doing the same thing on the opposite side, hovering the fingers and then lifting that arm up breathing, make sure you're not holding your breath. And again, make sure you're not collapsing into that opposite hip. If that feels okay, then you can progress on to lifting your right arm and your left leg, making sure you're not collapsing into the belly, pressing that left hand into the mat and your right foot and knee. Again, taking three to five breaths, and then you could go on and change Size. Again, making sure that shoulder's not creeping up to your ear, that shoulder blade's tucking onto the back. And that piece is really important to keep that shoulder stable. 
So that's it for the shoulder. And next we're gonna move on to learning about the hips, some common problems and some common solutions with some yoga and ball rolling. Let's begin with basic anatomy and kinesiology of the shoulder joint. So the shoulder joint and the hip joint have what's called a synovial capsule that helps to hold that joint together. So the capsule would be beneath these ligaments here and that capsule is filled with what's called synovial fluid. Many of you may have heard of synovial fluid before, and its purpose is to nourish the ends of the bones where the hyaline cartilage exists, and also to help your joint move freely and with less friction. So when we are not moving, meaning we're sleeping or we're sitting a lot, those joints are getting a lot of movement, so the synovial fluid becomes very gel-like and thick, so it makes it harder to move that joint. So what we want to do is do any type of movement that raises the body temperature and helps to get that joint and that synovial fluid flowing more freely and more viscous. So yoga, any types of movement like that will help to increase the viscosity of the synovial fluid and in turn nourish the ends of your bones, that hyaline cartilage, what helps to keep the joint healthy and strong and also moving optimally. The other piece that helps to hold that shoulder joint together are the ligaments that you can see here and the tendons that extend out from the rotator cuff muscles and other musculature to help secure that shoulder joint. We're going to focus on the rotator cuff today and the problems that we generally see. This is the most common area that we see issues with the shoulder. So the rotator cuff has four muscles, the subscapularis, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. The first issue we see with these four muscles is called tendonitis. And tendonitis occurs with the tendons, which is where the muscle attaches to the bone, and the tendon becomes very inflamed. This is generally due to an acute injury, degenerative disease, or a split or tear. We generally feel tendonitis more so when we lift our arm up to the front, out to the side, or up overhead. The second issue that we see with rotator cuff is called impingement syndrome. And this occurs when the soft tissues of the shoulder, so the musculature, the ligaments and tendons become compressed beneath what's called the acromion process, so it's right underneath here, and the humerus or, shoulder, or arm bone. Impingement syndrome tends to cause excessive rubbing of the soft tissues underneath the acromion process. So excessive rubbing of the rotator cuff on the scapula and as well as inflamed bursa. And bursa are fluid filled sacs that are uh, underneath the shoulder here and surround the shoulder to create less friction upon movement of the shoulder joint. If you're exhibiting any of these rotator cuff issues, you're not alone, but in your treatment and recovery, what you would want to focus on is creating some flexibility in the chest and strength within the back so that we can have a balanced and stable shoulder joint. So what happens is, is when we're rolling the shoulders forward and rounding forward, it's compressing in the chest, compressing the shoulder and creating an instability there and we're more prone to injury. So if we can lengthen our spine, sit the shoulders properly into the shoulder socket, creating openness in the chest, we are more better able to support that shoulder joint and all the different movements that we need to do. And we will focus on properly setting the shoulder when we are in our yoga postures today. Next, we're gonna talk about the abductors and problems that can occur with those muscle groups and how we can correct that with some yoga and ball rolling exercises. So if you're unsure, the abductors are part of our side core muscles. They're called the gluteal muscles and the tensor fascia latte. So the gluteal muscles have three muscle groups, the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius, the gluteus minimus, and our tensor fascia latte here. And these muscles work to stabilize the hip and are also part of our core. Often the abductors can become weak and often when this happens, our psoas muscles, so that muscle we talked about before running from our low back in through the hip to the front of our 
five wound or femur can take over and become really strained and um, sore. So if you do feel strain in the hip flexors, you wanna do some exercises that can really help to strengthen those outer hip muscles so that we don't get um, your pelvis rolling forward um, in an anterior tilt, which puts a lot of pressure on your low back. So some exercises that you can do with the ball, you can use a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, a little bit harder. The whatever ball you choose, you're gonna sit with your knees bent, you're gonna cross one ankle over the opposite knee, and then you're gonna take the ball and you're gonna place it underneath your bent knee onto the side of your hip here. And really get into all those muscle groups circling around, really finding that sweet spot. Maybe pausing for a few seconds on that area that feels the most tight. I'm gonna spend about 30 seconds to a minute on each side. Some different yoga poses to both strengthen and stretch the gluteal muscles. Um, we'll start with the bridge. So that one, you're gonna bend your knees onto your back, walk your hands so your fingertips reach down to your ankles. And then pressing into your feet, you're gonna lift the hips up and hold. A couple options, you can widen your feet. It helps to engage the other hip muscles a little bit more. Another option is to lift one foot up and that really helps to strengthen the one side, especially if we have one side that's stronger than the other. Again, holding for 30 seconds to a minute here. Another way to strengthen those side glute muscles is doing side leg lifts. So you can come onto your elbow or lying down onto your side, lifting through that leg here. What you wanna make sure you're not doing is tilting the toes up, because that's gonna trigger that uh, hip flexor muscles. So balance yourself out, tilt the toe forward or slightly down, and you'll get into those side glute muscles. If you wanna get a little bit more core work all the way up here, you can come up onto your elbow and lift the leg as well. A couple standing yoga poses that can be beneficial are triangle pose. So start about three feet apart, finding your front heel up with the inside of your back um, foot. And then like your hip checking, moving your hips back, you can put your fingers into that hip crease reaching forward, creating that long spine, and then you're gonna turn your head to lift towards the ceiling, or you can look forward if that's not great on your neck. Again, 30 seconds to a minute here. Of course, you do both sides. Next one is extended triangles. So you're gonna bend your knee, keeping that nice long line, pressing into the outside of your back foot. Again, that reaching forward, you can put your elbow onto your knee, reaching that arm up or over your head. You want to avoid rounding down to the ground. If you want to make it a little harder, place your fingertips between your big toe and second toe. Same option, but again, we want to make sure we're not rounding to get there. Again, holding 30 seconds to a minute here. The next hip issue we're going to talk about is sciatica. This is actually an issue that occurs with the hip as well as the leg or maybe into the low back. So that's because the sciatic nerve runs from the low back down through the hip, this yellow nerve here, to the back of the leg and into your foot. So this is caused by many things. The first issue might be a compression of one of the intervertebral discs here or a herniation of the disc. You can see this little red dot here putting pressure on the nerve. It can be caused by compression of the nerve anywhere along this where it runs irritation of the nerve or also irritation of the spinal nerves into the low back. It could be caused by a misaligned lumbar vertebrae as well. So if one of these vertebrae is pushing back onto the nerve, that could be really painful as well. So this can be a really common problem, especially if we are sitting a lot. Um, or maybe we have a misalignment in the spine. Some of the symptoms can be pain in your buttock area or running down through back of your leg into your foot, maybe even pain into your foot. It's usually a sharp, dull pain um, or dull and aching. It can be also a burning sensation. So there are some ways that we can relieve that pain by doing different yoga postures. 
Um, so I'm going to demo those now. The first one is actually downward dog. So you can start in a plank position. So wrists underneath the shoulders. You walk onto your toes and you're going to bend your knees till your belly comes towards your thighs, lifting your hips up towards the sky, creating a nice long spine. And you might want to walk out your heels here, right and left, right and left. But what this does is helps to lengthen through the low back, but also lengthen through the glutes and the backs of your legs all at the same time. Another option is doing extended side angle like we did for the abductors, or extended triangle, another word for it. So placing your front foot heel in line with the inside of your back foot, bending into that front knee, and then reaching forward. And for sciatica, we're going to keep the elbow on the knee to keep that length in the spine, especially if we have a protruding disc or something on the vertebrae. We want to make sure that the vertebrae are nice and stacked. So you're going to bring the arm overhead or up over towards the wall beside you. And then pausing there for 30 seconds to a minute. The third option is our ball rolling. So again, you can take the lacrosse ball or a tennis ball. And we can actually roll out the foot. So maybe you're leaving some compression of the nerve in your foot. So you want to roll through the full foot to start. And then kind of finding that sweet spot. And then pausing on the area that doesn't feel good. So it shouldn't be shooting pain, but a little bit of discomfort. You can take maybe three to four breaths, sort of exhale all your weight down to the ball. And then inhale, coming back up. And exhaling down. And maybe one more time. And then placing your heel down. And you want to get into all of the nut between the knuckles of your toes as well. Bring some space there. We're really spending like 10, 15 seconds there. And then you can actually flip your big toe up. This gets a really good stretch into the back of your heel. And pausing there, hugging the ball into the other foot. And then we're rolling through each of the toes, sometimes the ball rolls away. And then again, taking a good roll through the full foot. And then of course you move on to the other side. So another common cause of sciatica is actually piriformis syndrome, which is created when pressure is placed on the sciatic nerve by the piriformis muscle. So the piriformis muscle sits here, running from the sacrum down to the pelvis, which you can't quite see. And you can see how the sciatic nerve runs right through that muscle. So that becomes severely tight and it can compress on that nerve and cause a lot of pain. The muscle imbalances that are maybe occurring in the hip also can create a problem with the piriformis muscle and um, creating pressure on that sciatic nerve because the muscle imbalances pull the hip joint out of position that is optimal. Some exercises that can help with piriformis syndrome, there are several uh, yoga postures and um, a little bit of ball rolling as well. So we'll start with some um, yoga postures. The first one is figure four. So you can do this on a chair or seated. I'm gonna demo seated and on a chair. So seated, you're gonna cross your ankle over top of your knee. You wanna make sure you're not rolling the pelvis under. So hands behind you. Make sure you have a nice long spine. You can hold for 30 seconds to a minute here. The seated option in a chair is doing the same thing. So you can even do this if you're at work, crossing your leg up over your knee, and then all you're gonna do is flex forward. Again, 30 seconds to a minute there. The next option is a half seated twist. So you're gonna start with both legs straight. Again, if you feel like your pelvis is curling under, you can sit up onto a block to keep your pelvis in a neutral, stable position. And cross your left foot over. You're gonna reach your right arm up and you're gonna to start to twist around and grab onto your knee. 
That should get right into that piriformis muscle. The next option is um, a reclined um, hamstring stretch, but also gets into the piriformis muscle as well and the outer hip. So you place it around your foot and where your toes meet your foot and bring your elbows down to relax. You can extend your other leg nice and long. You might want to pause here for 30 seconds. And as you get in that outer hip, you're going to come across the body to feel a nice stretch into that outer hip. And you can bring your opposite arm out. Again, pausing here, getting all stretched into that nerve. Nerves don't stretch much, maybe one to 4%, but we're getting a little bit of space created there. And then you can come and get into the groin as well and come up to the side, placing your opposite hand to the top of your hip. And just balance out that hip, as we talked about before, imbalances in the hip musculature can create um, piriformis syndrome as well and tightness in that sciatic, compression of that sciatic nerve. So once you've been about 30 seconds to a minute in each of those positions, you can change sides. A couple different standing um, poses that you can do are what's called, this is a strengthener for that outer hip as well, um, it's called half moon. So if you haven't done this before, a good option is to sort of do like kicking off, kickstand behind you, and then getting your balance before you come down and place that block down. And then you can place your hand on your hip and you're gonna to start to rotate those toes forwards. Balancing here. You can also bring your arm up as an option. And coming back down. If that's a little bit too challenging, you can also use a wall. So you stack yourself right against the wall, leaning against that wall and doing the same um, pose, um, but having some support behind you. The next option is called Warrior Two. We've seen that a little bit already. It is feet three to four feet apart. Make sure your wrists are over almost your ankles here, front heel, and just looking inside of your back foot or heel. Bending into that front knee, making sure you can see your big toe here, and then reaching the arms out, looking forward, really pressing into the outside of that back foot. It really helps to stabilize the hip. And again, spending about 30 seconds to a minute there. The next issue that we're gonna talk about with the hips is IT band syndrome. And IT band syndrome usually is a problem um, with the IT band, but also it's called your, we already talked about this as well, your tensor fascia latte, which is actually the muscle that attaches into that IT band. Um, and the IT band attaches all the way down um, over top of the side of the knee into your outside of your shin. So this can become um, quite tight if our IT band is very tight, that'll tighten up to that, that band as well, causing some issues. And what that does is it starts to pull on the outside of the knee, pulling the knee out of alignment. Um, so we, we don't want that, obviously. So a way to um, sort of decrease that tension is to also strengthen those other gluteal muscles um, so that the tensor fascia latte isn't taking as much of a load. So, and the TFL is responsible for moving the leg sideways and flexing ex and extending the knee, but it will start to take over the, if the other muscles aren't strong enough. So we want to just really work to strengthen those outer muscles, the gluteal muscles, so that they can all work effectively together. You know, may also notice if you have IT band syndrome, if you have pain in your lower thigh, or when you get up from a seated position or when you're going to sit down. So some things that you can do to um, create some length in that IT band um, are the following postures and ball rolling exercises. So the first one is a um, leg lift like we were doing before. So relaxing your um, head and elbow down and you're just gonna start to lift and kind of reach back so you can feel that muscle working. Again, make sure the toes aren't pointing to the ceiling and getting the hip flexor and quad to take over that work. 
So here again, you can do maybe eight to 10 lifts. You can also hold for two to three seconds. If that's not enough, you can do more. Maybe doing three sets of those each side. Another option is doing some back bending. So coming onto your belly, bringing the hands underneath the shoulders, elbows tucked in. You're gonna lift and lengthen each leg back. And that's just like you're lengthening along the floor, lifting up, elbows tucking along your sides, holding. And you can hold here for again, 30 seconds to a minute. Another option is interlacing your hands over your hips or lengthening your arms back along your sides, lifting up through your chest and then lifting your legs as well. And again, 30 seconds to a minute. You can release yourself back down. And our last few exercises are revolve half moon. So this one is similar to half moon pose that we just did, but it's gonna be revolving the opposite way. So you're gonna kind of go into your kickstand, getting that balance into that front foot, get your balance, place your block in the opposite hand, extending that leg straight out behind you. And you wanna keep your pelvis very balanced. You don't wanna have it um, twisted. So nice and flat. And then you can even place your hand onto your left hip, which will be the one we're stretching. You start to look to the left or maybe even looking up. You can also take that arm and extend it out. And again, coming back to center and maybe spending about 30 seconds to a minute there. Our last option is some ball rolling. So again, kind of find the top of your hip and see how this is slightly behind that uh, pubic pelvis bone, you're going to do the same thing. So find, find it on your own body and then go slightly behind right into that sweet spot. And then you could come and place the ball into that area on the mat. And you'll know that sweet spot when you find it. So by releasing the TFL, it helps to also release that IT band because our tendons don't stretch really. They only stretch about one to 4%. So we want to create space um, with the muscles that do stretch a little bit more to create that um, space in the joint. So you can spend about 30 seconds to a minute here as well, and then changing sides. Thanks for tuning in to our yoga and ball rolling workshop today. We hope you learned a little bit about the hip and shoulder anatomy, kinesiology, and some yoga and ball rolling exercises. Please don't forget to tune in to our YouTube channel by subscribing and we'll see you next time.